Right. Um, good morning, everybody. And uh, welcome to the Young Physicians Forum conducted by the Ceylon College of Physicians for the month of June. Uh, as customary, we have uh, two speakers who are senior registrars uh, presenting the Young Physicians Forum. And the first talk is on chronic pancreatitis, an overview of the management by Dr. Vajira Taranga, who is a senior registrar in gastroenterology at the National Hospital Colombo. And the second talk uh, is uh, Who Let Androgens Out? An Update on Polycystic Ovarian Disease by Dr. Dhanushka Ratnayaka, who is a senior registrar in endocrinology at the National Hospital Kandy. We will start with the first uh, presentation by Dr. Vajira Taranga on chronic pancreatitis. Over to you, Dr. Taranga. Thank you, sir. And good morning, everyone. And I would like to thank Ceylon College of Physicians for giving me this opportunity. So today, my talk will be on chronic pancreatitis and overview of the management. So uh, my lecture outline would be, first I will go through briefly upon epidemiology, risk factors, diagnosis, and finally, my main topic of this uh, lecture, the management of chronic pancreatitis. So what is chronic pancreatitis? It's a chronic progressive inflammation and fibrosis, which leads to progressive loss of exocrine and endocrine pancreatic function due to irreversible damage of the pancreas. So uh, roughly the overall prevalence, worldwide prevalence is about 50 per 100,000 cases. And the, however, in South Asia, the incidence, the prevalence is, uh, prevalence is actually more. Unfortunately, we don't have local data about the epidemiology and there's slight male predominance. So what are the risk factors? Uh, out of the risk factors, the alcohol is the most common risk factor followed by tobacco use and also idiopathic pancre chronic pancreatitis is another main risk factor which includes tropical calcific pancreatitis. Other than that, other important risk factors are autoimmune pancreatitis and obstructive forces like pancreas division. So diagnosis, when, you, when there's a patient presented with features suggestive of chronic pancreatitis, when to suspect uh, the pain characteristic of chronic pancreatitis and exocrine pancreatic features of exocrine pancreatic insufficiency such as steatoria, or when a patient presented with diabetes and if you're suspected to have chronic pancreatitis, the first line, first the first investigation of choice is imaging, which itself can be diagnostic. So the contrast in a CT scan of the abdomen with pancreatic protocol is the first line investigation of choice for the diagnosis. It's also important to identify complications and exclude other differential diagnoses such as other GI malignancies. So at the, at the time of the diagnosis, you also have to investigate for presence of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency and for pancreatic endocrine insufficiency. And after the confirming the diagnosis, the thorough history and examination followed by investigations has to be done to identify particular risk factors because management, the modification of risk factors is an important component in the management. So in this slide, I want to highlight few few things. This slide summarizes the imaging modalities available for the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. So as I previously mentioned, contrast CD abdomen is the first, first line investigation imaging modality to look for calcifications, pancreatic atrophy, and presence of duct dilatation. And but the CT, C, contrast CT abdomen may not be very sensitive in, di in diagnosing early chronic pancreatitis. So in that case, if there's a still suspicion of chronic pancreatitis and if the CCD findings are not very convincing, then you can, uh, you can go ahead with an MRI with MRCP. So MRCP is, is good for detecting pancreatic ductal changes, mainly pancreatic duct dilatation strictures and irregularities which are well supportive of chronic pancreatitis. And the role of endoscopic ultrasound, so it has, a, it has the highest sensitivity in diagnosis, although there is a slightly lower specificity compared to other two imaging modalities. And uh, the role of EUS in the diagnosis is when there is 
the when the both the CT and the MRI is not very convincing, you can go ahead with the endoscopic ultrasound. So moving on to my main topic in this talk, which is the management of chronic pancreatitis. So there are certain aspects which I would like to highlight in the management. So uh, first, the risk factor modification and nutrition and pain management, exocrine failure and management of endocrine failure and finally the management related to chronic pancreatitis. So the, with regard to the modifying risk factors, the most important lifestyle modification would be abstinence from alcohol and smoking. It has several benefits which includes reduction in pain relapses which, which it has shown to slow the disease progression and ongoing smoking has shown to reduce the efficacy of endoscopic and surgical interventions for chronic pancreatitis as well. So nutrition, uh, malnutrition is a common problem in this category and there are multiple reasons for them to develop malnutrition which includes exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, poor oral intake, alcohol use and presence of diabetes. So uh, at the time of diagnosis and after that periodical assessment of nutrition is of paramount importance uh, with, with standard measurements including anthropometry and nutritional screening tools can be used and important to screen them for micronutrient deficiencies and osteoporosis screening is also an important aspect which I would like to highlight because they have apart from this nutritional the ex exocrine pancreatic insufficiency they have other multiple risk factors like smoking, alcohol, the lack of physical exercise those things also contribute and vitamin D deficiency and calcium uh, calcium deficiency would predispose them for osteoporosis and osteopenia. So moving on to nutritional management it is important to refer the patient for dietitians or clinical nutritionist for assessment and, and follow-up of these patients and after initial assessment if the patient is having a relatively normal or preserved nutritional status the nutritionally balanced diet is advised so if the patient is having malnutrition the one of the key component in the management would be adequate pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy which I would I will de dis uh, describe in detail in coming up slides and uh, the general recommendations for diet includes a high energy and high protein diet which is of small meals but frequent meals. The One of the important things I would like to highlight is there is no need to restrict fat. So fat restriction is only for people who is having very troublesome symptomatic steatorrhea after adequate management of exocrine insufficiency with pancreatic ex exocrine the pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy and there's no need of protein nutritional supplements but micronutrient supplementation should be considered in malnourished mal 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 patients and the treatment of vitamin D deficiency and osteoporosis should be according to the recommended guidelines in these relevant areas. So moving on to next topic the pain management. So pain is the most common and most disabling symptom in chronic pancreatitis and it is seen in up to 80 to 90 percent of the cases and it significantly reduces the quality of life. So pain management is one of the key areas in management. So what is the mechanism of pain? So still it is poorly understood but it's probably multifactorial. The, possi the possible causes for pa pain are recurrent episodes of acute inflammation and intraductal hypertension due to intraductal calculi or pancreatic duct strictures and parenchymal ischemia. Apart from that, there's important uh, another important hypothesis that uh, persistent and repeated stimulation of the peripheral the pancreatic nerves lead to neuroplasticity or sensitization at peripheral nerve level and central nerve level. And it is also important to consider other complications of pancreatitis, especially if the pain is not responding to conventional management or if the pain is worsening or new development or if the pain is recently worsened, we have to consider these complications which include pancreatic cancer, pancreatic cirrhosis or development of bilirubin structure. 
and don't forget other causes apart from the pancreatic related causes like peptic culture disease which is more prevalent in this uh, category of patients this diagram the high the is to show you about the central and peripheral neuroplasticity uh, this is the mechanism that they have that they are describing even after the pancreatectomy some a group of patient is uh, persistent to have chronic ex to experience chronic pain so so this is the mechanism that they are used to explain this persistence pain so this is the outline of manage pain management so initially every patient should be offered medical management and then if the patient is not responding to this conventional medical management or the conservative medical treatment then the further management is decided upon the presence of intraductal hypertension so what so this presence of pancreatic duct dilatation the mainly the main pancreatic duct dilatation is implicated as a sign of the presence of intraductal hypertension as the main mechanism of pain in these patients so if the patient is having dilated pancreatic duct on imaging which can be either due to calculi or strictures or maybe due to both the then the then the patients can be offered endo, the extracorporeal extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy or endotherapy or else surgery so if there's no significant pancreatic duct dilatation in which case we assume that there's no significant intraductal hypertension in those patients we have to continue medical management and we can offer endoscopic pancreatic sphincterotomy and uh, interventions like celiac plexus block and if they are still resistant for the management as the last option pancreatectomy so medical management of pain stopping smoking and alcohol is of great importance as i previously mentioned and the use of analgesics the guidelines recommends to to use the who pain ladder to guide your management so initially the patients can be started on paracetamol combined with uh, uh, adjuvant analgesics the adjuvant analgesics are the the which the drugs which have uh, have developed for other indications but subsequently found to have an effect on neuropathy especially on neuropathic pain so the opioid especially the 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 big opioids can be used in short term but strong opioids should be avoided as much as possible due to tolerance and the possibility of dependence so out of this adjuvant uh, the adjuvant analgesics the tricyclic antidepressants antiepileptic drugs including pregabalin and gabapentin and serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors like duoxetine can be used in combination with paracetamol or short courses of tramadol the out of these drugs pregabalin is the only drug which has uh, uh, which has undergone a randomized control trial and with proven efficacy so management of pancreatic calculi so symptomatic pancreatic calculi the management they can be depend on the size of the calculi if there are small calculi the patients can have can have undergone uh, ercp with stone extraction either using a balloon or basket if there are large size calculi they they can uh, the patients then they, those patients are optimum for uh, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy which can be combined with either with ercp or uh, mechanical lithotripsy is also another option and failing that surgical options are available and uh, for the so if the patient is having extensive calculi or multiple strictures and if there is suspicion of pancreatic head mass those kind of patients are not very suitable for eswl or ercp so those those group of patients can be offered surgery straight away so some facts about eswl so the best group of patients who are suitable for eswl will would be painful large radio opaque calculi ideally located in the head or body of the pancreas but there are certain exclusion criteria especially if there are multiple pancreatic duct strictures if there are isolated pancreatic calculi in the tail region and uh, presence of and presence of cholangitis or coagulopathy or even during the pregnancy and if there is another calcified structure 
on uh, which on the in the in the pathway of shock wave then still uh, it is not a suitable option so pancreatic redux strictures this, the options available for the treatment are ERCP with stenting, which can be the plastic stents, or if it's not responding, the metal stents are available, or the strictures can be dilated using balloon, and uh, the multiple strictures or resistant strictures can undergo surgical procedures. So what is the place of surgery in management in the pain management? So if there's non-response or inadequate response to medical and endoscopic therapy, or if there's extensive calculi or multiple strictures, they can, can be offered surgically. And the studies have shown a better long-term response rates compared to endoscopic therapy. And the available options are partial pancreatic resections, drainage procedures, and combined of partial resection or drainage procedures. And as the last resort in only selected group of patients, total pancreatomy with either cell auto transplantation is the last option. So what are the other therapies available? Pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy has been studied in various studies. However, the results are inconclusive. At the moment, there's the, the latest, the American gastroenterological the guideline does not recommend pancreatic replacement therapy as a sole management for pain. And antioxidant therapy, which, which has studied in several, uh, which has shown some efficacy in several studies, again, but the, there is limited evidence. So they can be used as a trial, but these formula, these preparations are not readily available. And cilia plexus block is another option available, which can be done under radiological guidance uh, by using the endoscopic therapy or uh, X-ray guidance. The, it, the cilia plexus block can be offered a pain relief for only a temporary duration, like maybe up to two to three months. So it can be used as a temporizing measure, or you have to repeat it in intervals of two to three months when the patient recurs with pain. So moving on to pancreatic exocrine insufficiency. So the incidence is about 80% in the second or third decade from the onset of the disease. And it is more, uh, the onset is more earlier in alcohol-related chronic pancreatitis they can present even in the within the first decade after the diagnosis. So what are the uh, features and how, are, how can you diagnose pancreatic exocrine insufficiency? So the clinical features can be can be weight loss or presence of malnutrition, which, which can be used in the anthropometric measurement. And the steatoria is the only a late sign. So the pan because the pancreas, pancreas has a very large reservoir with regard to exocrine function, at least when the 90, more than 90% of the pancreas is damaged, the steatorrhea will manifest. But before that, the micronutrient deficiencies can manifest, mainly, uh, including mainly the fat, uh, fat-soluble vitamins. And the investigations-wise, as a first-line screening, the, the fecal elastase test can be used. And the gold standard test for the diagnosis for steatoria would be fecal 72 hour fecal fat excretion, which is a cumbersome test, so it is not usually practiced. And measurement of the micronutrients, including vitamin D level, calcium, magnesium, and INR, the prothrombin time can be used. So, uh, when to use pancreatic replacement therapy? So, when there is clinical or biochemical evidence of pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, the pancreatic enzyme replacement is indicated. So they are available as enteric coated microspheres or mini microspheres, which protect them from destruction by gastric acidity. And this protective coat disintegrate in the duodenum and it, at a pH of above 5.5. So dose is minimum of 40,000 units of lipase because the lipase is the most important enzyme because it is not produced elsewhere apart from the pancreas. So the, the enzyme supplementation is prescribed with lipase units. So 40,000 units with a male meal and 50% of the dose with snacks. That's 20, at least 20,000 units. So it has to be taken with meals. So the response is assessed clinically. And what to do if the response is inadequate? So you have to check the compliance. And you can use a protein pump inhibitor if they are not already on because 
by gastric acid suppression you can increase the the duodenal pH because the in advanced pancreatitis the bicarbonate secretion from the pancreas also is impaired. So this gastric acid suppression uh, has shown to increase the enzyme availability. And you can double the dose if there is no, no response and still if there is no response clinically then you have to think other causes of fat malabsorption like small bowel bacterial overgrowth which can be there in this kind of patients. Okay, the next topic could be the management of pancreatic endocrine failure. So, the diabetes secondary to chronic pancreatitis is, is seen in about 1 to 4 percent of all diabetic individuals, and uh, this, this is more commonly seen in alcohol related and tropical calcific pancreatitis. The pathogenesis is important to understand the treatment. So, the destruction of islet cell will lead to reduction in the insulin and, uh, and another important mechanism is because of this mal the nutrition maldigestion there is impaired secretion of the incretins. So this in turn will reduce the endogenous the reduction of endogenous insulin secretion. Apart from that the destruction of alpha cells lead to reduced glucagon levels this is important because they are more prone for hypoglycemia and uh, the reduction in pancreatic polypeptide which is responsible for maintaining glycogen liver glycogen stores is also important because, uh, for they are, to describe them more they are, that they are more prone for hypoglycemia so diagnosis is uh, in every type of diabetes is similar that we already know and it is recommended at least annual screening in these patients for diabetes so the management of diabetes is a challenging area in these patients because they are the, up to 25 percent of them can have brittle diabetes which with the uh, market swinging of the between in between hyperglycemia and hypoglycemia and as I previously mentioned they are at increased risk of hypoglycemia because due to loss of glucagon they are in inconsistent eating pattern and the carbohydrate and absorption and in patient with alcoholic alcohol induced chronic pancreas can have concomitant liver disease as well. So it is important to get the assistance of endocrinologists in their management. So the management include the, the components of management is, uh, is same as other types of diabetes like lifestyle modification, pharmacotherapy and screening and management for, of complications. So pharmacotherapy, metformin can be considered as initial therapy but the problem is the frequent side effects may not be tolerated, the metformin may not be tolerated by majority of the patients. So in those kind of patients insulin has to be prescribed and insulin is first line in severely malnourished, mal malnourished patients because of the insulin's anabolic effects. The glenides may be used in low doses but the other classes of oral hypoglycemics are generally not recommended in this group of patients because of the side effect profiles and they are more, more prone for hypoglycemia. And the most other important aspects of the management of the glycemic control would be adequate replacement of pancreatic enzymes because I, as I previously mentioned in the pathophysiology uh, it, it, helps to, it helps to increase endogenous secretion of the insulin as well as reduces the incidence of hypoglycemia. So this is one of the key areas in the management. Then the screening and management of diabetic complications is also important. They are more prone for metabolic emergencies. And the microvascular complications are seen as frequent as other types of diabetes. However, it appears they are the, the macrovascular complications are relatively low in this group of patients. So then moving on to the management of complications of chronic pancreatitis. So this is a uh, big area but I would like to highlight only on some important complications. So the complications could the, as I previously described the pancreatic calculi and pancreatic duct strictures and uh, the, other, the other possible complications are uh, because of the fibrosis due to, due to prolonged inflammation can cause strictures, biliary strictures and narrowing of the duodenum causing gastric outlet obstruction and uh, Pancreatic carcinoma is another complication with especially in long-standing chronic pancreatitis 
And the pancreatic duct disruption can be associated with pancreatic pseudocyst formation, and in turn, it can be associated with pancreatic ascites or pancre pancreatic or pleural fistulae. And because of the inflammation, pseudoaneurysms can be formed in the, especially in the splenic artery, which can rupture, can cause torrential hemorrhage, which can be life-threatening. And the thrombosis of the, the splenic circulation, the, mainly the splenic vein thrombosis and portal vein thrombosis is also described in this group of patients. So I will describe some important complications uh, in summarized form. So pancreatic pseudocyst, the prevalence is about 20 to 40% in chronic pancreatitis. So when to treat pancreatic pseudocyst in these patients? So in, if they are symptomatic or if they are complicated or if there is large size and if they are persisting, then the treatment is indicated. So the, what are the common symptoms? The abdominal pain is the most common symptom. And the complications would be infection, bleeding, or rupture, and causing surrounding structure, obstruction like biliary or duodenal obstruction, uh, would be indications for treatment of pancreatic pseudocyst. So the methods of treatment will depend on the lo location, the size of the pseudocyst, and whether the cyst communicate with the major pancreatic duct. So what are the options available for the treatment? Endoscopic drainage is the first line option and especially in uncomplicated pancreatic pseudocyst. So endoscopic drainage can achieve via two routes, either transmural drainage via the stomach or via duodenum or uh, using transpapillary drainage through the pancreatic duct. And surgical drainage is another option and percutaneous drainage is now only considered in when the, uh, when the endoscopic therapy or surgery is contraindicated or no, no, unsuccessful, then only the percutaneous drainage can be considered. Common bile duct strictures are due to fibrosis involving the pancreatic head and uh, it is important to exclude a malignant stricture in these patients. So taking brush, cyto brush cytologies and repeat imaging with MRCP is important and the every pancreatic duct stricture, the treatment is not indicated. Treatment is indicated only if they are symptomatic. That means if they are having jaundice or having cholangitis, or if there is persistent elevation of the alkaline phosphatase about two folds or persistently high bilirubin levels are the indications to treat pancreatic, uh, the common bile duct strictures. So the treatment options would be ERCP, the biliary sphincterotomy, and pancreatic stenting. So the treatment options available for other complications are pancreatic, for the pancreatic duct injury, stenting can be done. Pancreatic ascites is another important complication which can be treated with pancreatic stenting or with surgery. The pseudoaneurysms of the splenic artery can be treated with angiographic embolization, especially if it is associated with pancreatic pseudocyst. Before drainage of the pancreatic pseudocyst, treatment of the pseudoaneurysm is indicated because there is an increased risk of rupture. The, the splenic vein thrombosis, the role of anticoagulation is doubtful. However, these populations are more prone to develop fundal varices. So the fundal varices treatment is with, uh, with uh, the glue injection the, and management of portal hypertension with breather blockers as in other, other patients. So the, the key messages I would like to the highlight in my topic are it's important, uh, multidisciplinary involvement is important in management these patients and strict avoidance of alcohol and smoking. Adequate pain relief is important to improve quality of life and adequate pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy is important both for nutrition management as well as glycemic control. And it's important to screen them regularly for malnutrition and bone health. Thank you for listening and I would like to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Taranga. Unfortunately, we've run out of time, so I don't think we have time for questions. Uh, so thank you very much for your excellent presentation. We will move on to the second uh, uh, lecture, which is by Dr. Danushka Ratnayaka, who is going to speak on who let the androgens out, an update on polycystic ovarian disease.
Dr. Ratnayaka, over to you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you, sir, for your kind introduction. And uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to thank CCP for uh, this opportunity granted to me. My topic is today: Who let the androgens out? An update on polycystic ovarian syndrome. Without much ado, I will go into the straight into the topic. This is a clinical case we commonly encounter in our clinical clinic scenario, uh, clinic setup. A 20-year-old girl presenting with irregular menstrual periods for two years duration. She's obese with a BMI of 28. And features, there are ample features of insulin resistance such as acanthosis negricans. And she's her tooth with a ferrimen gold waist call for possible 22. And she had no clitoromegaly. The million dollar question is, what does she have? There are multiple possibilities. Uh, the, if I state them, polycystic ovarian syndrome, Cushing's disease, uh, hyperprolactinemia, non-classic CH, thyroid dysfunction, androgen secreting tumors, all of these diseases can give rise to this clinical scenario. Uh, the, our topic is today is polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a diagnosis of exclusion. I will go into that. Uh, then we have to suspect when to suspect the, whether the patient is having polycystic ovarian syndrome. The things for polycystic ovarian syndrome are any woman of reproductive age and with a history of irregular menstrual periods and symptoms of hyperandrogenism, acne, hertusism, male pattern hair loss, and the presence of overweight or obesity should further raise question, uh, suspicion about the polycystic ovarian syndrome. And if you encounter these features in a patient, alarm bells should ring in your head. This could be polycystic ovarian syndrome. Then how to diagnose whether the patient has polycystic ovarian syndrome or not? It is done according to a diagnostic criteria. The most common one is a Rotterdam criteria, which was published in 2003. But there are there is an evolution of uh, diagnostic criteria. I will discuss about them and the most recent ones. And the first one published was NIH consensus criteria published in 1990. It required all three criteria mentioned here, menstrual irregularity due to oligo and ovulation, clinical and or biochemical evidences of hyperandrogenism and exclusion of all other possible diseases. Then the Rotterdam criteria came in 2003. It required two out of three uh, criteria, oligo and ovulation clinical and biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism and polycystic ovarian morphology by ultrasound. Here I would like to highlight that from these 2003 things have evolved up to now and this definition of two or more follicles in either ovary measuring two to nine millimeters in diameter and increased ovarian volume more than 10 millimeters have changed now. With If you are utilizing, it all depends on the ultrasound machine you are using. If you are using a uh, ultrasound machine uh, that has more capability than 8 megahertz, the follicle level goes up to about 20 follicles for uh, diagnosis of polycystic ovarian uh, in the recent guidelines. And the uh, key problem in this Rotterdam criteria was as perceived accepted by some uh, clinical societies was that it is was possible to diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome without evidence of hyperandrogenism. So in uh, 2018, there another definition came by Androgen Excess Society. They required all of these criteria, clinical and biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism and ovarian dysfunction as evidenced by oligo and ovulation and o polycystic ovarian ovarian ultrasound and exclusion of other androgen excess or ovulatory disorders. So I would like to highlight here the presence of hyperandrogenism was mandatory in this Androgen Excess Society definition in 2008. And uh, making it a uh, pivotal to diagnosis. Then uh, this is a common problem we encounter in our clinical scenarios. The uh, patient get referred to us because of the she has uh, found to have nothing else but having polycystic ovaries on the uh, ultrasound. Then she has, if she has no hyperandrogenism features, no menstrual dysfunction, she needs no further evaluation. She does not have polycystic ovarian syndrome because having follicles or uh, uh, polycystic ovarian morphology is common in a reproductive, can be common in uh, reproductive age females. And why do we need to worry about polycystic ovarian syndrome? And it is associated with risk factors for cardiovascular disease such as obesity, glucose intolerance, dyslipidemia, fatty liver disease, obstructive sleep apnea, etc. And it is associated with a poor quality of life and well-being. And it has a massive psychological impact on the patient. 
and my majority of these patients have poor diagnostic experience related to the long delays and inadequate health information it is stated in research that two to uh, it takes about two to three years for a patient to come to a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian after the initial presentation then uh, what are the clinical features that we should look at menstrual dysfunction hyperandrogenism such as acne male pattern hair loss hirsutism and features of insulin resistance uh, features of uh, sleep apnea, mood disorders, mainly depression and anxiety, impaired quality of life and eating disorders we have to be in lookout for. And I would like to highlight that when using Rotterdam criteria, many patients can be diagnosed based upon the history and the physical examination and history of menstrual irregularities and uh, based on the menstrual irregularities and clinical signs of hyperandrogenism. Our history and physical examination should be geared towards the to exclude other differential diagnosis and come to a diagnosis of a polycystic ovarian syndrome and to look be on the lookout for associated complications. And uh, other important aspect I would like to draw your attention to is whether when the patient comes to you complaining of a menstrual abnormality, does she really have a menstrual cycle irregularly? As per recent guidelines, when the patient, this is I am talking about the adult females, this the Definitions of oligomenorrhea differs when the patient is in the adolescent age and when the patient has more than 35 days for a menstrual cycle or has less than 8 cycles for a period of 1 year, she can be diagnosed as having oligomenorrhea. And other the point I would like to highlight is the having regular menstrual cycles does not rule out the patient is having anovulation. Even the hyperandrogenic women, even though they are eumenoric, may be not... May, ovulating. So to come out of that difficulty, the uh, possibility is measuring luteal phase progesterone and the ultrasound mechanisms. And the other thing is the ferryman Goldways to score to assess the degree of hertiosism. And this ferryman Goldways score can be subjective and it varies according to the racial background. If you take the East Asian uh, population of the world, they have less body hair compared to the Med Mediterranean and the South Asian women who have comparatively more hair. So, Ferryman Goldway's score of about 5, 4 may be not very significant in a uh, female of uh, Middle Eastern or South Asian origin, but it may be very significant in a female of uh, East Asian origin. So, we have to be uh, careful in interpreting this. And if the patient has a virilization or rapidly developing hyoidism, we have to be careful whether the patient is having any sinister causes of hyoidism such as ovarian malignancies, and antigen pro, uh, producing malignancies, etc. And for the investigations, we should always be in the lookout for uh, the, whether the patient is having patient is pregnant and uh, oral dexamethasone suppression test to rule up uh, to screen for Cushing's disease and prolactin, thyroid stimulating hormones, FS, and the role of LH is contentious because the LH to FSH ratio is not a criteria for diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome and estradiol levels. Uh, early morning 17 hydroxyproteinol levels to measure to look for non classic ch and we are and we are measuring androgen and dhgs androgens that we can measure are total testosterone in our setup the, the problem with total testosterone is it lacks precision and sensitivity on these polycystic ovarian patients the uh, raise uh, testosterone levels are only raised to a, a mild degree of raise from the uh, normal levels. So, in that level, precision and sensitivity can be low. And other problem is uh, about only about in 10% of the patients, only abnormality and the only androgen that can be elevated is DHGS. And the 25% of the polycystic ovarian patients may have elevated DHGS as well. So, in the case of the patient is having normal testosterone, uh, we would guidelines recommend that you go for a DHGS testing. And the AMH levels can be elevated though in the upper limit of the normal. The problem with the AMH is it does not have international standards. So, but it, it is in the uh, clinical literature. It can come up in the future as an in investigation for the polycystic ovarian syndrome. And the other, one of the other common clinical problems we encounter is if the patient has been started on a treatment, multiple uh, majority of these patients, when they present to clinicians, they are on combined oral contraceptives or any other treatment. We have to be careful when interpreting tests when the patient is on 
combined oral contraceptives. So we have ideal method would be to stop the combined oral contraceptives for at least 8 to 12 weeks and measure the serum antigens and sex hormone binding globulin levels when they become to normal levels. Then I will go into the pathophysiology. Why this, this female got polycystic ovarian syndrome? There are multiple methods multiple hypotheses and multiple micro, um, methods circulating. I will go into neurohormonal aspect. It describes a increased frequency of GnRH secretion, uh, which in turn increases testosterone output from the ovaries and the adrenals. And these uh, androgens can be uh, uh, can be uh, extragonadally converted to the estradiol and the estrones, which will act on the endometrium and give rise to endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial carcinoma. And in turn, this testosterone acts on the hypothalamus and it blunts the negative feedback effects of estradiol and progesterone on the hypothalamus to reduce GnRH secretion. There are other uh, non-reproductive hypotheses also come into aspect. One of the main, main one is the insulin resistance and the beta cell dysfunction. Uh, the uh, evidence suggestive of this was published in Dune by in JCM in 1987, try the old data, Dune fatal. Uh, and they suggest they compared the two cohorts of polycystic ovarian patients who well, were one group were lean, one group uh, with increased BMI. There was, irrespective of the BMI, it was found to have the patients were found to have high insulin levels. So it was found to be the patients, uh, it high insulin levels were integral part of the pathophysiology of polycystic ovarian syndrome. And other, um, other me mechanisms were that were put forward, so hepatovisceral fat excess, uh, iron overload, sympathetic overactivity, and there is a strong genetic aspect to polycystic ovarian syndrome. There are novel genetic uh, laws have been found out and the biological path has been found out in the recent literature. And in the future, there could be novel methods of prognostication and uh, prediction of this disease. Then I will go into the treatment of this disease. Uh, there are main five targets of uh, treatment. First one is resolution of hyperandrogenic features and the menstrual abnormalities. Second is the prevention of endometrial hyperplasia and the carcinoma. Third one, management of underlying metabolic abnormalities and reduction of risk factors for type 2 diabetes and uh, cardiovascular disease. And the contraception and the ovulation induction for those who are pursuing pregnancy. I have tried to summarize the management options we are that are available. For menstrual abnormalities, hormonal contraceptives can be the first line. For obesity, exercise and lifestyle interventions. Second line, pharmacotherapy and the bariatric surgery is also an option. For the fertility, confine citrate and the letrozole is now coming up as the first law, uh, uh, first line management. GnRH treatment as the second line. It is you practice in the centers of excellence. And the problems, other problem in, for impaired glucose tolerance and the diabetes, metformin is the first line treatment. And hydrocism, acne, and the uh, cosmetic aspect, hormonal contraceptives, and the androgen, anti androgen therapy can be the treatment. Uh, so I'll go into the details of this treatment. Uh, metformin also can be used as adjuvant therapy to prevent ovarian hypostimulation. And the Endocrine Society guidelines in 2013 suggested against metformin as the first line for weight. They suggest against metformin as the first line for weight loss and st against statin therapy and insulin sensitizers. Here, insulin sensitizers are now coming up in the literature uh, with evidences that uh, the patient can reduce insulin levels and increase ovulation with thiazolidin ions. Uh, it may come up in the future as a treatment modality. When we approach the obesity treatment of obesity, obviously weight loss is the way to go forward. And uh, uh, how to approach that is diet and lifestyle modification, pharmacotherapy, and if necessary, bariatric surgery. It is crucial for the management of polycystic ovarian syndrome. The, in the studies, it has been found that loss of body weight of two to five percent from the baseline helps the re helps to restore ovulation and insulin sensitive in obese and unnovulated women. But the problem with this now randomized trans and long-term data on weight loss. 
Bariatric surgery is a viable option. And there are some studies published into JCM in 2005 that uh, involved 17 women with polycystic ovarian syndrome, had a BMI of 50, undergone surgery with a loss of weight, uh, 42 kilograms over 12 months. They had resolution of ovulatory cycles, improvement in insulin tolerance, uh, insulin resistance, hyperandrogenemia, and erotism scores. The evidence for weight loss, metformin as a method of weight loss is contradictory. There are some studies for metformin and some studies against metformin. Uh, so to be unfair in the safe sites, lifestyle, diet and lifestyle modification is put forward as the first line treatment for this. The liraglutide also is showing uh, promising results. There are studies found is, uh, published in 2017 that uh, suggest uh, liraglutide when combined with med patient with poor response to metformin has shown weight loss. Then we come to the treatment of uh, her menstrual cycle irregularities. Uh, the first line treatment is combined oral contraceptives. It helps to uh, control menses for contraception, improving androgenic symptoms, uh, and it antagonizes the intermetrial proliferative effects of estrogen and cutaneous benefit for hyperandrogenic manifestations. The, those who cannot uh, tolerate uh, combined oral contraceptives, cyclic progesterone-only treatment or IUDs can be utilized. Uh, metformin can be utilized as a second-line treatment in select groups for obesity. And it has shown an improved uh, for menstrual irregularity. It has shown an increased ovulatory rate, but it is uh, contentious whether it is enough to reduce the risk of endometrial carcinoma. We can whether the, see whether the patient is ovulating the, by utilizing luteal phase progesterone or uh, ultrasonic scans. For the cosmetic treatment, options available are the hormonal contraceptives and how to how long to treat how long is a problem, but it is going on by case by case decisions. And then we can start antigen therapy if the patient is not uh, satisfied with the clinical outcome of after treating six months with the combined oral contraceptives. If, for example, uh, spinal lactone can be used. The problem with these things is uh, this treatment is uh, risk of prevent the this fine uh, anti-androgen therapy can prevent development of uh, normal external genitalia in early pregnancy in case the patient becomes pregnant. So it should be th uh, stopped three months before the conception and should be used with a reliable method of contraception. And other treatments available are laser treatment, mechanical methods, dermatological interventions such as antibiotics and retinoids and topical treatment also can be utilized. Other met metabolic complications, prevalence of impaired glucose tolerance is sky high in these patients, 30 to 35%, with the pre prevalence of frank type 2 diabetes in 3 to 30%. At a diagnosis of polycystic ovarian syndrome uh, confers a 5 to 10 fold risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus. Endocrine Society recommends OGT2 or HB1 for screen purposes. Metformin is put forward as the first line of treatment. And studies in the polycystic ovarian syndrome are uh, still too small to determine whether the patient metformin prevents diabetes or not. So we can go by diabetes literature. And uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, as we can say obese, in obese patients, can be a problem. And uh, guidelines suggest not actively looking for that, but if it encounter that, it needs uh, referral to the suitable specialties and being adhered to. Uh, both weight loss and metformin appear to have metabolic and Im to improve metabolic and hepatic functions. And how to address dyslipidemia and the role of statins? It is uh, approach is same as for other patients with dyslipidemia and exercise and weight loss are the first line to first line approach pharmacotherapy if needed. Statins are useful for treating the dyslipidemia but from the polycystic ovarian syndrome aspect it is not advocated and it is not recommended. For obstructive sleep apnea, uh, we should uh, be, uh, be on the lookout for a obstructive possibility of obstructive sleep apnea. Use a questionnaire like Berlin's questionnaire and, and if, if in the case it comes as positive, we should uh, go for a formal polysomnography and assessment. A mental health compromises of a large 
component of this patient's care because they are more prone to poor body image and anxiety and depression. We should be always in the lookout for these problems in this patient and suitable referrals and treatment interventions should be taken. And the fertility is a major issue in all these patients. Letrozole is now coming up as the first line uh, treatment bypassing the clomiphene citrate. Uh, cost and the availability is a problem with letrozole and clinician must always discuss this is a not a FDA approved still and alternative as a confine exists and it has low adverse effect profile and a low high success rate compared to uh, uh, clomiphene citrate. Unfortunately, these polycystic ovarian syndrome patients are associated with uh, higher rate of uh, pregnancy morbidity such as higher rate of miscarriages and uh, they are associated with the GDM and hypertension. So we should be on the lookout for them as well. So, but getting the patient pregnant and the reduction of body weight is not the end of the story here. The patients carry their uh, legacy, legacy into the, the adult and the middle ages as well with high prevalence for diabetes and impaired glucose tolerance I mentioned before. So we should, it should be a holistic approach to of care of this patient. So, Thank you very much for listening. I will conclude my presentation. Presentation. Um, we don't have any questions online, but uh, if the judges have any questions. Yeah, thank you for that uh, presentation. Uh, my Actually, I'm, I only want a clarification. Can you please tell me the exact connection between insulin and uh, PCOS, how would, uh, are they just associations or is there a, a biochemical connection between them? Uh, the exact mechanisms uh, I am not aware of, sir. Uh, but there has been uh, ample evidence to suggest the uh, increased prevalence of impaired glucose tolerance and diabetes in these patients uh, with evidence. And in your initial assessment, you also suggested we should do prolactin and TSH levels as well. Yes. Uh, why was that? So, uh, because the patient is presenting to us with a uh, uh, initial presentation would be uh, menstrual irregularities and oligo, uh, oligomenorrhea can be a possibility. So, in that hyperprolactinemia can give rise to uh, ovulatory dysfunction and the thyroid dysfunction also can give us similar pictures. So. Okay, so it's uh, there's no connection with PCOS itself for no, the no, manifestation no, presentation. for the diagnosis. Okay, right, thank you. So. Uh, there is one question uh, from the Zoom chat box. This is uh, for the first speaker. Uh, he's asking, are there any commercially available uh, forms for pancreatic exocrine failure? Yes, uh, there are co uh, commercially available preparations. Uh, there are several brands available. However, in the government sector, the pancreatic enzyme replacement ther the therapy is available. They are available as either 10,000 units uh, capsules or 25,000 units capsules. Yes, I must thank you also for your presentation. That was also very clear. Um, you suggested that uh, these patients with uh, chronic pancreatitis should have uh, frequent meals or more frequent meals. So that surprised me a little because wouldn't that stimulate the pancreas more uh, to produce more enzymes and cause more injury? Uh, actually, sir, that's uh, the main reason for frequent small meals would be one thing is with large meals, they might cause discomfort, the abdominal distension and discomfort and the pain may be the, 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 that may be one with large meals. The, and the frequent meals, the reason for frequent meals would be they are more prone for uh, hypoglycemia. Uh, and so with the frequent, um, in the free, more frequent mealing would uh, prevent they develop them developing hypoglycemic episodes uh, and they might with a small diet might be the, the available pancreatic enzymes might, might be sufficient for the compensation that's another possibility i think there is one question for the second speaker where the question is can liraglutide be used as monotherapy for diabetes in PCOS in an obese patient uh, there has been studies uh, for that um, in the 2017 published data that uh, liraglutide has proven uh, benefits against the placebo study. So there are uh, evidence favoring that.
can i ask what it does what in what sense does it uh, what is the outcome what is the outcome that is achieved by the use of lirubrid is it weight loss or control of diabetes or what's the outcome measure uh, outcome measure has been the weight loss sir. weight loss any more questions in the absence of further questions i must thank both of the speakers uh, for the excellent presentation very interesting and timely topics and i think shamita will do the honors with the certificates so thank you very much both of you dr danish karatnaik and dr vajira taranga for your brilliant presentations thank you very much on behalf yeah. of this is for dr vajira taranga samara vikram डॉक्टर धनुष्कर रत्नायक so that brings us to the close of the young physicians forum thank you very much to the special thanks to the judges for participating today to dr shamita for um, chairing uh, the session and handing out the certificates we would also like to thank uh, the cleanmark staff uh, and our sponsors today uh, for supporting us for, and the audiovisual staff for their continued support um, thank you very much <laughs>